I'm going to be discussing the role of MR in the evaluation of cardiomyopathies. And in doing so, I want to focus on how MR can be helpful in answering specific clinical questions. I'm going to be covering a variety of myocardial diseases. But before I do that, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the technique that's used when an MR is performed for the evaluation of a cardiomyopathy. So the exam usually begins with Cine bright blood images that are particularly good at looking at function. So we can look at the contractility of all the walls, see whether the myocardium is thickening normally, and assess the competence of the valve. Following the Cine images, we perform delayed enhancement imaging that Dr. Reddy just um, discussed. And as he mentioned, these are inversion recovery sequences with an inversion time picked so as to null normal myocardium. So in a normal study, you'll see uniformly dark signal throughout the myocardium. The presence of contrast enhancement on these images is abnormal. And you can get contrast enhancement as a result of either acute or chronic infarction. But you can also get contrast enhancement as a result of a variety of, in, of infectious and inflammatory processes. So the key thing when you see enhancement on these images is to ask the question, is the pattern of enhancement that you see on the delayed enhancement images consistent with myocardial infarction or is it more suggestive of a non-ischemic process? Now to answer that question, we turn to what we know about myocyte injury as a result of infarction. We know that the first cells that are damaged are in the subendocardium. And then there's a wavefront of injury that extends from the subendocardium through the wall. So that the contrast enhancement we see on delayed enhancement imaging as a result of infarction is always in the subendocardium and then extends variably through the rest of the wall. That's in contrast to the enhancement patterns that we see as a result of inflammatory or um, infectious processes. And generally we see one of three types of patterns there. You can see mid-myocardial enhancement that Dr. Reddy just showed where you have foci of enhancement in the middle of the myocardial wall with sparing of the subendocardium. You can see epicardial enhancement. So here we spared the subendocardium and the midmyocardium, and you just have a thin rim of enhancement in the epicardium. Or occasionally you can see diffuse global enhancement. And if this patient's enhancement was due to infarction, the whole left ventricle would have infarcted and the patient would essentially be dead. So this is much more suggestive of a global diffuse infiltrative process. So keeping these patterns of enhancement in mind, let's talk about some specific myocardial diseases, beginning with a clinical scenario that's really quite common and that Dr. Reddy alluded to in his last talk. And that is in a patient who comes in with a big heart, which is poorly functioning, poor left ventricular systolic function. And the question becomes, is there dilated cardiomyopathy due to coronary artery disease, or is it due to a non-ischemic process? Here, for example, is a patient with a history of alcoholism and known coronary artery disease who comes in with an incredibly poorly functioning heart. He's got a big heart and his injection fraction is probably something in the order of 10%. Question is, is his dilated cardiomyopathy due to his coronary artery disease? And, in which, and if it is, then he might benefit from revascularization. So to answer that question, we turn to what we know about ischemic and non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. We know that ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies generally affect the left ventricle to a much greater extent than the right. And we also know that in virtually all patients, they've had some prior infarctions, and those infarctions lead to regions of focal wall thinning. Non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies, on the other hand, generally involve the right ventricle to the same extent as the left, 
And while the myocardium may be thinned, it's generally uniformly thinned without any focal thinning. The pattern of enhancement is also different when we look at delayed enhancement imaging. Patients with ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy virtually all show some enhancement on delayed enhancement imaging, and that enhancement pattern is consistent with prior infarction. So you have enhancement of the subendocardium, and particularly in the regions of wall thinning, you get transmural um, enhancement. That's as opposed to patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, in which frequently you don't get any enhancement at all on delayed enhancement imaging. And if you do, it's in a pattern more suggestive of a non-ischemic process. Non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies that don't enhance at all are, include idiopathic cardiomyopathy, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, and postpartum cardiomyopathy. And those dilated cardiomyopathies from a non-ischemic standpoint that do enhance Generally, the patients have a history that's suggestive of a prior myocarditis, as we see in this patient with a history of Coxsackie B myocarditis, in which you get subendocardial sparing, but they have extensive mid-myocardial enhancement. So what about our patient? Well, he has a big heart, and it's both the right and the left ventricles that are enlarged. And on delayed enhancement imaging, we see uniform low signal throughout the myocardium. These are findings, the constellation of findings is most suggestive of a non-ischemic process. In his case, probably secondary to alcoholism. And this is an important um, diagnosis to have made because essentially what we're saying is that if, he re if we revascularize his diseased coronary arteries, he probably won't regain much in the way of systolic function. Okay, let's turn to another clinical scenario that unfortunately is not that uncommon, and that is in a seemingly healthy young person who all of a sudden has a cardiac arrest. They're revived, and the question becomes, what was the cause of their cardiac arrest? Well, MR can be particularly helpful in making a diagnosis in one of three entities, all of which can lead to sudden death in a young patient. And these are cardiac sarcoid, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Let's begin by talking about cardiac sarcoid. So sarcoid, as you know, is a multi-organ system disease, and it's estimated that about 5% of patients with sarcoid have cardiac involvement. But that number is probably spuriously low. And it's probably low because the sarcoid gran granulomas are deposited in a patchy fashion throughout the myocardium. So it's very easy to have sampling error. You have a normal biopsy, whereas in fact sarcoid is present elsewhere in the heart. Why do we care about making a diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid? Well, we care because the deposition of sarcoid within the myocardium can lead to dire consequences. It can cause ventricular aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms. It can affect the function of the AV valve, and it can affect the conduction system, leading to arrhythmias and sudden death. So that patients who have a diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid need to have defibrillators placed. Well, because the diagnosis is so hard to make, the Japanese Ministry of Health has come up with clinical criteria by which a clinical diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid can be made. And to get the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid, you have to have an arrhythmia plus an abnormal anatomic or functional study using either echo, nukes, or catheterization. Notice that MR currently is not one of the criteria, 